bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the most read group of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more, all featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one, from the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness, this is Oilers Overtime. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons. I'm here with thehockeyraiders.com, uh, bringing you another week, the third week of some content for the Edmonton Oilers specifically. And we've got our regulars back with us again, three shows in a row, and everybody's back, which is awesome. Uh, Colton Pankey's with us. Colton, how you doing, bud? Good. How's it going, guys? Good, good, good. Brian's, Brian Swain's with us, too. Brian, how you doing? Doing very well. Excited to be back again. Awesome. And Tegan Gieselbrecht is with us, too. Uh, Tegan, how's it going? I'm uh, feeling great. The sun's out today, so you know, I'm pretty happy about that. So doing pretty good. Yeah, no, it's been an interesting uh, week weather-wise here in anyway in Edmonton, but not so fantastic when it comes to the, the most recent couple of games for the Oilers. Um, I'm assuming here everybody got a chance to watch that game last night against Calgary. What's the mm-hmm. safest way to describe that game? Frustrating? That's the word I would use. If you could pick one word, what's the word that you would use to describe that game last night? My word's going to be frustrating, and I'll tell you why in a second. But, Colton, what's the one word you would use to describe that game last night? Um, Jeez, oh put me on the spot. Yeah, I, I know, didn't tell you that was coming. Exciting. <laughs> I, know they, I know they lost the game, but uh, I thought it was just really back and forth, and I thought it was a really good high-paced game, so exciting, I guess. Brian, what about you? I'm going to go with a eventful 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 there were a number of notable things that happened in that game that i'm sure we'll be talking about here shortly so yeah that's what i'll go with yeah well that's kind of where i'm leaning to but my word wasn't quite the same as yours we're not so positive anyway uh tegan what was your word irritating right along there with you guys too irritating yeah uh for me the biggest thing that i took away from that game other than the fact that i thought the action was okay uh, it was definitely daryl setter hockey you know it was shutting things down and keeping everything it wasn't to say a trap so much but frustrating for that reason because the Oilers didn't really get a chance to break out. There weren't too many two-on-ones. There weren't too many real opportunities for anybody. But all the things that I think the Oilers have steered relatively clear of this season, you know, injuries, we saw some of that. Um, Frustrating goalie play by Mike Smith for the most part and whatever it's now been, nine, something starts. He has totally controlled the puck when he comes out of the net. And he had a couple instances last night that were a little iffy and one that led to kind of a goal there. So I thought it was kind of frustrating only because we saw some stuff last night. Uh, that really we didn't love uh, from previous times. And it was a little whatever that way. We're going to talk about some of those injuries, but um, Tegan, I'll go back and we'll go in reverse order. With the injuries, what might be more of an issue? Uh, the way that Jujar Kara went down or the fact that we don't really know what's going on with Tyson Berry. Uh, he sounds like he's day-to-day. Is there one of those things that caught your attention more than the other? Um, I would definitely say losing the main quarterback of your first unit power play is, is going to have the bigger effect moving forward on this team. Um, yeah, I, I am unaware of what the injury was. I'm not sure if you guys picked up on today what the room, if there is any rumors floating around what it was. Just speculation, I guess, at this point. But, uh, yeah, losing this guy who is, you know, coming this year, team-friendly deal, he's definitely proven himself to the majority of the fans. I'll put it that way. To the majority of the fans, he's proven himself. But yeah, losing this guy is, is tough. I would say he affects the the ins and outs of the day-to-day and kind of how the team is going to play moving forward. Well, we're going to talk about both things. But Brian, which one bothered you a little bit more? Was it the uncertainty, uh, as Tegan said, we don't really know exactly what's going on with Tyson Berry, or the way that Jujar Kara had to leave, uh, answering the code, fighting for that sort of thing? It was a little questionable hit that he gave, but uh, that didn't look good. You know, that was not a pretty sight to see when he left the game. Uh, which one, I don't know if bothered is the word, but which one are you more keen to pay attention to? Um, well, they're both, you know, I mean, in terms of both players face an uncertain immediate future anyway, but I, I would say the Kyra thing stood out for me because uh, it's once again brought to the forefront a topic that, you know, it's comes up a lot now, or it's come up a lot in recent years in hockey, and that's about, you know, fighting in the code, quotation air quotation marks around that um it was it was a to be frank a disturbing image when when he got knocked down um you know that was pretty frightening what you see and it just um so that's probably what's really going to stand over you from that game we'll see what the situation is with barry there's a lot of unknowns there uh as tegan was saying it's day to day but whether that's one of these day-to-days it kind of morphs into week to week 
Um, hopefully not the case, but I, I think definitely the Kyra thing. That was just a, that was a pretty uh, jarring image at the yeah. end of that fight. Yeah. Col- Colton, I'll get you to elaborate a little bit on that one. So we've got Kara, who I don't know, would you consider him a heavyweight? Not really, right? I mean, I guess in today's NHL where there's less heavy, I, I don't think he's a heavyweight. I'd say he's kind of in that next echelon. Did you think the hit was dirty? Like that he probably, I, I'm assuming he knew he was going to have to answer for that. But did you think yeah. the hit was, was kind of dirty and that was coming? Yeah, like obviously not intentional. It's not really the way he plays. But I think you can almost kind of see it as soon as he made the hit. I think he realized that he got him up higher than he intended to probably should have been a call. And I was kind of questioning whether or not there would be a, a ruling from uh, NHL player safety today, but yeah, it's kind of that code thing that you guys are talking about. And that's up for debate on whether or not that should be a thing. I think it's too bad that there wasn't a call there. Cause I think if there is a call that may kind of almost help police the players a bit more. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to just ask you. If there had been a penalty called on that, would there be a need for Britt Ritchie to step in there and, and kind of say, Hey, you know what, you and I got to, th- figure this out because Kara knew that that was probably coming. Brian, you're shaking your head. Is that, is that a no? You think that if the, uh, the call was made, there probably would have been a fight. I think the probably we still would have seen something if there had been a, a, a call there. Now, I, you know, it depends on what the call was. If it's five minutes, maybe, maybe not, but you know, if it's, he's off for two minutes, I think as soon as he's back on the ice, he's, he's still having to, uh, to answer the, uh, the proverbial call. Do you think Tegan with Kara kind of really the tough guy, the designated, I guess Darnell nurses too, but there's no Zach Cassian in the lineup. He might be coming back soon, but is Kara kind of the guy, you know, is he the one that has to answer all those questions? I mean, obviously this was a direct hit that he delivered. So he was responsible for answering for that, but you know, by your know, process of elimination in most situations, is he the guy? Cause I don't see him as a heavyweight either. In fact, when mm-hmm. I saw that fight, uh, he wasn't really at every time, at any time ever winning it it was just not very close and that last shot was one of those like bad timing could have ended a little earlier because he was losing pretty handily um is that a role that Kara should be trying to assume considering that the Oilers don't really have you know a heavyweight like Colton said and there's not a lot in the league but Cassian's not around so is that the thing Kara feels like maybe he has to do uh, yeah, exactly. You hit the nail on the head here. Uh, yeah, it just seems like without casting the lineup, as you mentioned, he has been seen uh, in practice kind of getting better, kind of been out there a little more uh, this evening. And so, um, yeah, I think Kara feels like uh, when things are going things are going rough and rowdy, I know it's the Battle of Alberta, so things tend to go that way, or they, they, at least they have been over the past two seasons. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. Without casting the lineup, Kara might just have to enter the bell when he needs to. My only concern, I suppose, in watching, I mean, there's obviously concern for Kerry. You want to make sure that he's okay, first and foremost, and that there's not anything permanent going on there. But uh, I am kind of curious, and maybe you guys can weigh in on this if you think I'm right or wrong here. Is this the kind of fight that you lose and it changes the way you play the game? Because we've been talking a lot about Jujar Kerry in the past and how he doesn't always engage. He's not terribly effective in seasons past, but he's been pretty good this year. You know, there's been a lot of positives coming out of his game. Do you think this sort of thing like holds him back when he does return? If it's not very long-term, uh, is he more hesitant? Does he not play with the same edge? Does he not, you know, get in there and, and feel like he, cause maybe he's lost some confidence, you know, lose. Cause you don't see some people maybe lose a fight like that. Uh, Colton, do you think this changes his game? Uh, it's an interesting point. Not one that I had really considered. Like when it, when it first happened, obviously you knew he was going to miss some time. And I was thinking more unfortunate just cause, all around he's playing good this year. He's putting up secondary offense and everything. And you hate to see a guy get out of his rhythm. Um, it will be curious to see maybe the first couple games he is a bit, but I think ultimately he's been playing this way. I mean, obviously, like you said, he's inconsistent at times, but he's been playing this way since he was, I don't know, probably started junior hockey, maybe even before that. So I, I think eventually he'll go back to his old form. Yeah. Tegan, maybe we see this with the uh, players who are typically just prototypical heavyweights where the skill isn't always there, but Kara, uh, like Colton said, he's a pretty good player. Uh, when he's engaged, he's pretty effective. He can score, he can penalty kill, he can do all sorts of stuff. So he's got other aspects of his game. Do you think that changes things? You know, like oftentimes we see a heavyweight lose a massive fight and then they never come back to the NHL after that. Um, that's probably not the case for Kerry. Eh? Well, uh, I, I hope it's not, you know, the case with him. Hopefully he comes back and has a speedy recovery. Uh, you know, that was definitely need him moving forward. Um, but yeah, 
I don't believe this is a, a career ender. You know, that's quite the, the exaggeration, I guess, if you were to refer to it as that. But um, in terms, he is a, a streaky scorer. He does have on nights and he has off nights as well. There's nights where he's practically invisible. He, they, they might as well not have him playing sometime because he's just not there. And I'm not sure what this does to his confidence. I know they, that hit in front of the, the Flames bench was quite aggressive, but um, it, I, I don't know if this will definitely shake his confidence. I mean, I've never been knocked out and, you know, been laid on the ground at anywhere, any time in my life. So I couldn't imagine, you know, I know there's no fans in the arena, but there's thousands of cameras. This is on so many highlights. I'm not sure what it does to your mentality moving forward for him, but uh, I think he will recover from it, at least we're hoping, physically. And mentally, he, I think he's got to get back into practice and get back into reps. Brian, how, how excited do you think the Oilers are to potentially see Cassian coming back in? I know Colton maybe wants to chime in on this too, but uh, Cassian's pretty close, it sounds like. So how excited do you think the Oilers are to have him back? I mean, he hasn't been terribly effective offensively this season, but he does bring that, uh, that presence with him to the lineup where maybe Calgary doesn't try to do so much of that. Uh, I don't know. Again, that wasn't initiated by Calgary Care did the hit, but uh, is it exciting to see that Cassian could be coming back? And if so, and when he comes in, where does he play? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, I, I don't expect him to be back for the, the rematch here with Calgary. If he was, uh, that would really certainly add some, you know, no pun intended, fuel to the fire. Um, he's exactly what they need in the lineup. I'm not personally necessarily the, the biggest fan of the guy in the world, but there, he's obviously there's something that he brings to the team, an element that the team has been missing that he brings. Uh, I think they're going to have to shift the lines around anyway. Uh, the Going with the top three, there, or with uh, Dreisaitl and McDavid alongside Yamamoto on the top line is obviously, I mean, it worked great for a week. Now it's time to get back to the drawing board and try to find some balance about the lineup. He can certainly help address that. Um, obviously, you get into with Kyra being out for who knows how long. That's going to involve a little bit of juggling as well to address that situation. So I, I don't know. I mean, I I might immediately put him right back in alongside uh, on the top line alongside McDavid. I don't know what everybody else's thoughts on that are. Actually, that's what I was going to ask you next, Colton. Do you think he goes in at a high scoring position and has an opportunity to get offensively sparked, or do you think they put him in at a depth position at first? Yeah, I think, like Brian said, I think they will um, sh they shake up the lines. I think it's kind of that time again. I kind of see them giving him a bit more of minutes on maybe the third line, kind of get him back into play. He's been off for, I don't know, I want to say three or so weeks now. It could be off there, but just let him get the feel of it again for the first few games. But I do think in the near future we could see him back on McDavid's side. I'm going to stick with you here, Colton, when we move on to the next topic here. Um, before we go there, just a reminder to everybody who's watching, uh, hit that subscribe button on our YouTube page. Hit the like button on Facebook. Uh, let us know that you like the show. Uh, tell us how we're doing. If there's anything you want us to talk about or see in the next episodes, we'll be happy to do that. But, uh, Colton, we talked a lot last week about Tyson Berry. We'll talk a lot more now about Tyson Berry because of the fact that he's potentially out, uh, we hope, for not very long. Uh, but then there's this whole debate between – okay, well, there was talk about trying to maybe sell high on Tyson Berry because he was producing so well and the trade deadline's coming up and he might ask for a big, huge contract. Uh, maybe they sign him, maybe they don't. Uh, do you think that if he's gone for any extended period of time, it becomes very quick, very fast, that Oilers fans are going to realize how valuable he is to the team? Or does it not really change much because they have people and, pay and pieces that can fill in where he was? Uh, no, I think it'll be pretty quick. Like right shot defensemen are pretty tough to come by in the league to begin with. I think uh, there's been kind of Tegan kind of mentioned at the beginning that for the most part, fans are happy, but there is this kind of rising voice you see on Twitter of people that seem to be kind of suggesting that he's being carried by McDavid, Dreisaitl with all these secondary assists and everything. I don't really buy into it. Just like the, the selling at the deadline, like you brought him in on the one year deal to hope that he could play good and bring them back to the playoffs and keep guys like McDavid and Dreisaitl happy. So I just, I do think that they will uh, be, a, yeah, I think they'll realize the impact that he has on this team if he's out long-term, like you said. Yeah, I hope, I mean, they would have said something by now, I'm assuming yeah. if there was much more of an issue than something day to day. And I didn't even notice, like Tegan said, I don't know where it happened. He just sort of left at the end of the first and he tried to come back for the third and it didn't quite happen, but um you know, like, is it ridiculous, Tegan, to think that the Oilers should even consider? And I don't think they are. 
but that fans are so vocal about the idea that Tyson Berry be moved before the trade deadline. I mean, this is a team that's certainly in the thick of things for the playoffs. Barry's going to be a huge part of that uh, when he does come back and he has been so far, he got a little, a little slow start, but I mean, for crying out loud, the guy's got more points than any other person to join a new team. He's, I don't know what he's got for actual points. I don't have the stats in front of me, but he's been great. So is it just ridiculous to think that the Oilers would even contemplate moving him? In my opinion, absolutely. Um, you mentioned there the stats. I have the stats right in front of me. Actually, I'm going to bring them up. I figured because, you might. Uh, yeah, I know. It's just, I know people want to bring in certain aspects of things and kind of, they kind of have these, these, their certain point of views. So I want to bring in stats, their numbers, and they're just kind of, this is the cold, hard truth. Okay. So here we go. All right. So <laughs> Tyson Berry is um, 18th in the league amongst defensemen in scoring. So that already right off the rip, like top 18, that's good. Like at 18, that's good to go. Um, he's tied with two other players for fifth in assists with 20 on the season so far. So has 20 assists through 31 games. Again, that's, that's, not, that's not something to shy away at. He's a defenseman. Um, I believe, in my opinion, the Oilers have been looking for an offensive defenseman for what seems to be seasons now. So I believe that Tyson Berry, this talk about trading him is, is beyond ridiculous. Um, he's tied with another player for fifth and total points with 24. So yeah, 24 points through uh, 31 games is pretty darn good. I don't know why people are just on the big train to, or try to jump on the train rather, to get rid of him. I, I believe he should stick around. Yeah, I mean, you talk about offensive defensemen. I'm going to throw out some names here that the Oilers have tried to use in these positions. Sheldon Surrey's one, Lubavir Vizhnowski, when they grabbed him, they thought he was going to be a player that could maybe do that. Everybody talks about Chris Pronger, but even his numbers weren't as good per game as Tyson Berry's, we have to go all the way back to Paul Coffey to really talk about how productive Barry has been in those games so far. Um, and the argument that people say, oh, McDavid, dry settle, if not for him, you you wouldn't be getting those points, Barry. I think that's the craziest argument that you could possibly make. You've got these players on those teams and in those spots for a reason, right? Because they play good with good players. That's the entire point of putting them on your team to begin with. Um, Brian, you want to add anything to you know, Tegan's stat line there, just how effective Barry's been? Uh, what's your take on him? I was enjoying reminiscing about all the old Oilers offensive defensemen. Like we got a little bit of Yanni Inamas and Roman Hackerlick. Uh, you can go back to back. I mean, you're right. It's it's something they've been really chasing forever since Paul Coffey left the team. That's how hard it is to come by a player of this caliber. Not to suggest that Tyson Berry is Paul Coffey by any stretch of the imagination, but. Uh, this is this has been that elusive piece that they've been searching for for so long. It's funny when you started when you brought the topic up, Jim. Is that we we from the beginning of the season we talked a lot about what are you going to do with Barry, you know? And and to me, in the last two weeks, that that was the first time I've heard that mentioned in probably a couple of weeks because he's become so essential to the team now that that conversation has almost gone away, and he's. He is, uh, whatever degree of success the team is going to have, he's going to play a large part in it. So I think he's someone that you want to look at keeping around for a long time. I know we talked a little bit about what kind of contract you might have to give him last week. It might be a situation where you have to, you know, pay a little bit more in the back end of the contract the last couple of years. He's not quite producing at a rate worthy of value. But to, to have someone like that for the next two, three, four years when you hope that the others are contending in their prime, I think that's huge. Cool. And I'll, let, I'll leave the last question for you on this topic, but uh, we're going to see Evan Bouchard, I'm assuming, if Tyson Berry is not going to be playing in the next game or the game after, which will make a lot of fans happy because there's a huge cry in Edmonton for people to see Evan Bouchard get more playing time. But what do you think the Oilers do? What does Tip do? Does he elevate Ethan Bear and put him with Darnell Nurse? Or does he get Bouchard in there in the role that Tyson Berry would have played on like the power play? Because that's kind of the same sort of, offensive gift that Bouchard's supposed to give you, right? Like he's a quarter quarterback power play. He loves to shoot. You know, you don't need to ask him twice. Um, what do you think is going to happen in that respect? We're assuming that Barry might be out of game or two. Does Bouchard slot right in there or do you elevate Ethan Bear and do you think he can handle it? It's interesting because bear has been struggling a bit this year. So you do wonder if you kind of give him that time, if maybe that could give him some confidence back. But I expect Bouchard to kind of be the guy that steps in there. 
like you said, on the power play, I think uh, five on five, they're going to keep them pretty sheltered. Like lots of games they've had them in this year. They've went with seven defensemen. Obviously they won't be doing that here, but I, I think, uh, I think his minutes will be very sheltered if Barry is out for any time at five on five. But I do think that he'll get that time on the power play. Well, you talk about seven defensemen, which I guess could transition us a little bit because Mike Smith has often seen like an extra defenseman, right? There's a goaltender that likes to come out and play the puck and move it up to the defenseman and in the forwards and stuff like that. And he, he had a kind of a first real gaffe of the season. Uh, he had a few of them last year, but this was a real kind of first. But still, clearly, we're talking about Mike Smith is is clearly the starter. At least that's the way it seems to me uh, from Dave Tibbetts' point of view. Uh, Koskinen seems like he's an afterthought at this point. Give him some credit at the beginning of the year for doing what he did. But Smith is the guy, uh, and that's that seems to be the way it is. Tegan, do you do you think that's the right play? How do you see this goaltending equation now? Is is Smith going to get most of the starts from here on in? Is it a 50, 50 split? Are we going to see, you know, cost going to maybe give way a little bit for somebody like Alex Stalock? Like, what do you, what do you see happening? What's your take on the goaltending situation now? And does what happened last night with Smith uh, matter? Well, if you forgive Smith for last night's blunder, I mean, it wasn't truly honestly his fault alone. It's kind of bad puck luck. If you believe in that sort of thing, um, where he kind of went out before the trapezoid, there and the puck was going to a stick and it bounced over and it went to the no play zone for him. So if you push that aside, I believe it's just, it's pretty crystal clear now that he's become the number one option for the Oilers. Um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, his record is seven, three and what, or seven, three and oh, as a starter, I mean, it might be eight, three, you know, right now, but um, yeah, I believe it's him moving forward. Costing in, I feel really disappointed, I guess is the word. If you're going back to the one word game, uh, I guess disappointed is kind of how I feel regarding Hoskins' performance whenever he's been in net. And, uh, yeah, Dave Tippett has made it clear that it's just, it's one and two, that Mike Smith is the starter. Uh, Brian, what about you? Is this uh, something where we maybe see the Oilers consider doing something with Koskinen? You know, sitting him as now a third-string goalie, maybe moving him before the deadline. Is Are the Oilers that confident in Mike Smith? I don't know if they are or if they can be, but I, I think it's very telling that Smith is starting uh, for the second game against Calgary, too, after what was a lot of us were assuming that they'll go back and get Foskett in a shot after what was not the best outing of the year for, well, to me, you know, probably be completely blunt about it, it was probably his, his weakest game of the year against Calgary uh, in the 4 3 loss. So, um, I think that's pretty telling that he's going to get another shot at it here. This is that this is leading trending, and we've seen it over the last month since he's come back from injury. Anyway, that it's trending more and more towards him carrying the, the load and, and getting the majority of the starts. As for Koskinen's future, um, maybe they look to move him, especially if you know Stalock supposed to be uh, eligible to come off the uh, the COVID. Uh, quarantine list here in, in the day or two so whether he gets some action and he proves himself to be you know a worthy tag team partner for smith do they maybe they could look at moving cost i'm not sure what kind of a market there would be out there um you know if he makes it through waivers or what the situation would be uh, i think we're just looking at either you know a tandem or even a trio moving forward for however long the others uh, go this season and into the playoffs i think the goaltending situation is is what is addressed in the off season. And this is just what they're dealing with right now. And as far as what they have right now, Smith is starting to emerge clearly as the number one. Colton, do you think that Smith has played himself into the conversation of maybe looking at another extension next year? This is a guy that nobody doesn't age. Like he's in probably the best shape of any oiler on the entire team. Uh, he's a good leader. Uh, his play can be questionable at times, but he's been pretty rock steady for this season. Do the Oilers maybe again, look at one year deal next year uh or is this like now nah, we got to move on we got to look at something else we we struck out this year which is why we signed them but um you know we need to figure out something different for our goaltending yeah i'm not admittedly the the biggest mike smith fan especially last year um i was on him quite a bit but he, he has been uh like really good this year he surprised me and i think a lot of people that wanted him out um, the only thing I'd be curious about there is with Staylock, I could be wrong. I think he might still have one year left. He's got I, one more I could year. be wrong. Yeah. So then I, 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 I mean, I, they could move on from him easy still and bring Smith back, but I like, I think they're going to try and bring in a different goalie regardless. So I, I could see them just keeping Staylock as their backup and then trying to move on from Koskinen and just 
letting Smith go. But I mean, if he keeps this up, then yeah, if you can get him on a cheap deal again, which I mean, he's 39. So you would, then yeah, I, I guess it would make sense to bring him back. All right. So let's, let's touch on one more thing and we'll do this as quickly as we can. Uh, maybe we'll say like 15 to 30 seconds per answer, but we'll do kind of our mid season of the year awards. Cause we've been sort of doing this on the hockeyraders.com. We've been writing articles about it, uh, talking about, you know, where people are at, who we would rate in certain positions uh, towards the season. So Tegan, I'll start with you. Uh, if you had to pick an MVP and it's probably going to be the same for most of us, but if you had to pick an MVP on the season, Tegan, who are you picking? Oh yeah. The man himself who is just straight money, Connor McDavid, obviously. Uh, I don't, I don't even need the, the last couple of seconds I have here. 20 seconds, you know, like I don't, I don't need that. Connor McDavid right. MVP. Easy, easy. What about you, Brian? Who are you picking? I'm going to want more time for the other answers, so big David, that's it. Colton, same thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's an obvious one. When you have McDavid on your team, it's really hard to try to find reasons to pick somebody else, right? Uh, I would, in a situation like last year, I would have maybe made an argument for Drysaddle, and he's been really good this year, but uh, I did find, and I may have mentioned it last week, that Drysaddle has that tendency when he's not hot to look like he's frustrated. And McDavid just seems, even though he's gone scoreless, in a few games this season, he's always on. Even when he's not scoring, he's doing something. So it's absolutely McDavid. Okay, uh, we'll go the other way. Colton, we'll start with you. Uh, biggest surprise of the season. If you had to pick a player on the Oilers that would have shocked you the most as doing something that you didn't think he would do or as a disappointment, some sort of surprise, who would you pick? Yeah, I would say Jesse Pugliari. I think uh, there were so many question marks heading into the year, especially after how it ended a couple of years ago. Um, th- yeah, I really wasn't sure what to expect and he's looked really good. I mean, he had a great chance again last night to tie it up. So late in the game. So yeah, I'd say pull Yarby. Brian, what about you? I'm going to go with Kyra. This guy was on waivers at the start of the year. You know, he was coming in with a lot of question marks to begin with. And then, and then to have that way to start the year and clears waivers, no one even picks him up. And it wasn't like he was even costing a ton either. Comes back and he's just been fantastic. He's given them so much of what they needed. He's, he's been good in the draw. He's, you know, he can kill penalties. He stepped up and, you know, whether you are pro or con fighting, it's, it's here. And he's, I think he's had four or five belts already this season. So he's played a role that way. He scored some big goals. He's just, he's been the best he's been in his career. And most importantly, he's been consistent. Uh, these are words I never thought I'd use with two-jar Kyra. So definitely it's got to yeah. be him. Tegan, are you picking Kyra uh, or uh, Pooley Arvey as your surprise this season? Or you got somebody else? Actually, neither. I'm going to go with uh, Kyler Yamamoto as my surprise player of the year. I mean, so far he has uh, seven goals and nine assists through the 31 games played. And he's just, yeah, I know he's a young guy. And I didn't think he'd, you know, take to the NHL just the way he has. I know he's been played in seasons prior, but it's just this, the way he's this kind of shone through this season is just, it's, it's incredible that his chemistry with Drysaddle and um, McDavid is just, it's just so, so general and just, sorry, I'm not general. It's just so, you not unique, but it's just, it has its own click and he's found it comfortably. He's there all the time. He's definitely, you know, we've got some big goals in his belt so far this season. And so he's my surprise player. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly starting to come on. He, he definitely he didn't have quite the start to the season like he had the last 27 games last year, but he's certainly looking better now. And when he's with, we talked about Barry being with the right people. When, when Yamamoto's with the right people, he knows how to produce and where to go. Uh, I'll say my biggest surprise of the season might be Dominic Cahoon, uh, and probably not for great reasons. Uh, when they got him, they assumed that, that chemistry would be there with dry saddle. And maybe that's not fair to do just because they're both German born players, but uh, they really thought those two would click and it just hasn't really happened. And so much so that he's barely playing, um, which is a shocker to me. I'm a little surprised that he's not uh, seeing more ice time that he hasn't produced in the time that he's been given. Sometimes he has a two little game and then he'll disappear for games at a time. So I was really hoping that the Oilers had found a, a cost effective, you know, depth player that could be in their top six. And it just hasn't worked out that way. Kyle Turris might have been my second surprise, but Dominic Cahoon is going to get the vote for me. All right, one last one. Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, if there is a need for the Oilers coming into the trade deadline, what have you recognized as that need? Well, first off, uh, I'll just say that goaltending obviously is something that needs to be addressed. But as you said, or as I said, I, I think that's can wait until the offseason. They can't get uh, the, the goaltender that they need. They can't afford it for 
to, to pay the cost of that at this point in time. So for right now, for a move they could realistically make, I think a second line left winger would be great. I think that would really help bring the balance to the lineup that they need in their forward lines. Um, we talked about uh, Jake DeBrusque last week. Uh, there's going to be a few names floating around up there, but I think that's it. Someone on the second line, left wing, they can play with Dry's title. Tegan, what about you? Have you recognized the glaring hole for the Oilers so far this season? Uh, I would say it's not quite glaring, but I just I would hope that the Oilers find a way to secure some more stability stability when it comes to uh, the top four defensemen. Uh, that might be someone that they're trying to you know find a way to fix, I guess, moving forward. Uh, that's, that's my pick is just yeah, another defenseman add in there, someone with, ex- with experience, preferably, uh, who has really good, uh, stick, uh, like high, like high hockey IQ and is really good in the power play and penalty kill. Colton, what would be your move if you're Ken Holland? Cause we know he doesn't have much money. So what's your move? What's the thing that you would try to fix first if you could only make one move? Yeah, I think like Brian said, I think a top six winger is ideal, but not to ride on him, I guess I'll say a third line center. I really liked when they were bringing up Eric Stahl and obviously he can slide up and move Nugent Hopkins back to the wing. So I think if you could get a top six winger or a guy to, that could play on that third line center role where Terrace was supposed to be, that would be a really solid pickup. Yeah, I'm with you totally there, Colton. I think Stahl makes the most sense. Unfortunately, I've heard in the last couple of days that maybe a Canadian team is not a realistic option for him, which would be a real bummer. But he can play third line center. He can play top six winger. He can play top two center if you're really stuck. Uh, He's just got a lot of options to him. I really like that a lot. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us this week. I appreciate everybody coming in again. Uh, We're going to have you on next week if it works out for all of you. We've got a uh, guest coming up for the second half of the show. But just a reminder for everybody who's watching the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check out all the other content on the Hockey Raiders. We've got tons of team action with videos every week, uh, and you'll enjoy that stuff. Go to thehockeyraiders.com for everything else. Like the Facebook page, follow us on Twitter. I don't know. I could keep going, but uh, check us out. And thanks guys again. And we will uh, talk to you next week. This has been another edition of Oilers Overtime. We've got a special guest coming up next. All right, everybody. Welcome back. We've got a special guest with us on the Oilers Overtime this week for our third edition. We've got Dustin Nielsen of TSN is with us. Dustin, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming on. Um, So I got to ask you, we talked a little bit about this off the year, but you've got a pretty sweet outdoor rink going on here. Uh, you're one of the final guys on social media that can say in this Edmonton weather that it's still rocking and you're working on it. You're going to do that after this video. I understand. Yeah. I'll sneak in another flood tonight. I think it's going to be about minus one by 11 o'clock. So I can hit it before bed. And then it's supposed to be pretty chilly overnight. And, and then minus three tomorrow night might be it. I mean, if I, if, if you could tell me that we'd get minus five, in the evenings for the rest of March, I keep her going, but it looks like we might end up with, uh, you know, temperatures above zero at night, which makes it difficult to maintain. So I've, you know, this is my first year doing it. And, you know, when I first did it, we bought a little kit from Canadian Tire and just sort of flooded. And then, you know, I realized that you know, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So then I got some boards from a listener and kind of like, and ground was already frozen. So it was really tough, but I wedged some boards in at one end. And then I was like, well, that's pretty good. So then I decided to put like an eight foot extension on the end. So I like somehow connected that flooded that up, put boards around that. So I've, I've learned quite a bit this year and I'm already looking forward to next year, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, we've got one. I live on an acreage out here in Shirt Park and we've got one oh, on our property nice. too, but I'm telling you, I think it looks like a Slurpee now. So I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not going to be uh, skated on one more time, which I'm sure is disappointing my son completely, but uh, <laughs> there's not much I can do about that. Um, I wanted to chat with you real quick about uh, you're doing a ton of video content these days. Uh, Has that changed because of the pandemic and COVID and the way that the industry has changed? Or is that just something that you're like super keen on doing and just loving right now? Uh, Well, I do love doing it. I've like really learned to love doing it. It's, it's been fun. Um, It's probably a little bit too much. I think I'm doing like 27 podcasts and streams this month, which is a little bit overkill, but it's all things that I love to do. So it doesn't really seem like work, even if it is quite a bit of extra work on top of it. But basically how it came about is, you know, I was, I, I was working with Oilers Nation and things were going good. Then the pandemic hit and they needed to cut some guys back. And I was one of them. And, uh, and then with no Canadian football league last year, I found myself with more time on my hands. Cause if there would have been a CFL season, I probably would have been gone most weekends. So, uh, I, I just, I like to stay busy. It let, stops me from worrying about the pandemic and worrying about a bunch of other stuff going on. So we had two guys in a goalie. We started that with the nation network 
And then when they had to cut everything back, they didn't want that anymore. So I took that one and kind of put it under my own sort of company name. And then um, that one went going pretty good. We're about 125 episodes in on two guys and a goalie now. And then I just, you know, felt like, you know, probably could get some Oilers content with the season firing back up in that bubble and being here. So I started the oil stream and brought in Gazola and I always just love talking fantasy football. So that one, I mostly just do for fun. Um, so yeah, fantasy football extravaganza was good. And then when that ended, I was just like, man, I gotta, I gotta keep this going. So I started a sports betting podcast and stream with hustler out of Winnipeg. And he's, he's absolutely phenomenal talent that we've always wanted to kind of do something together. So when this opportunity popped up, we decided to, to go at it. And I honestly think, you know, with sports betting, it's already massive, but I think it's going to get even bigger in this country. And I think it's going to be important to the national hockey league and, you know, maybe the Canadian football league, we know it's a monster in the NFL. So I think it's an area in our country that was kind of a little bit, um, you know, under delivered on. So uh, we've had a lot of fun with that. We started with one episode. Now we moved it to two a week and uh, yeah, so it's kind of just, if, if the pandemic wouldn't hit, I wouldn't probably have any of this going on except maybe two guys in a goalie. Cause we were already doing that before some time make a little bit of money off it which was nice and uh you know just generate content i don't think you can ever have too much well i gotta tell you i get a kick out of your late night laugh with lieutenant eric i watched that one last <laughs> night and the shuffling of the papers like a david letterman at the end it always <laughs> always gives me a good chuckle. it's perfect stuff that's a funny one because you don't know how many people have said in the weekend in review that we do and it's it, like we keep it less than 220 so we can put it on twitter and I mean, that's that's where that's where sports is. I know Instagram and everything else is bigger, but as far as sports content goes, I think Twitter is a big place for that. And uh, so we, yeah, we do it less than 220. We usually, I don't have a problem keeping it under 220. Sometimes it has, but you're not the first person who goes, man, you know what my favorite part is? That paper shuffle at the end. I'm like, oh yeah. That's if so you stop weird, doing it, people, people be yeah. like, what the heck? We just did it the one time we didn't like, recite like we didn't script it or anything just kind of at the end of the first episode we we both kind of went like that and and then yeah it's funny it's weird how little things like that really make a difference it's strange yeah no i i'm a huge fan of your stuff and keep putting it out i know it's been keeping you busy and and going like crazy but uh it's it's awesome stuff to watch and it it really does show how much you're following all the sports and especially hockey so we should probably steer on that direction because we are an oilers uh, video <laughs> cast and we talk about that stuff uh i did see one of the tweets and one of the conversations you had on one of your shows about Nugent Hopkins recently. And you were talking about whether or not you thought he might accept a deal. I think it was 6.25 for five years. Uh, what was the consensus on that one? Did you guys find that that is something you think he'll do, or that might be a little hard to swing for Holland? Yeah. You know, the, I put that poll question out on, on Twitter this morning too. 6.25 million for five years from Nugent Hopkins. And basically I was asking fans, you know, from a team perspective, we need to do that. And the last time I checked, it was earlier today. It was like 88% said yes they would do it uh but there's this there's a vocal minority that's kind of turning on ryan nugent hopkins right now and it's it's not sitting too well with me and i i understand that you know the last thing you want is to give a guy seven years at seven mil i was talking about it with low tide at the end of my show today and he said you know as long as there's no sevens involved he'll probably be happy with everything and that's not a bad way to look at it as long as there's no sevens involved if the number doesn't start with a seven and if the term isn't seven i think you can probably justify getting that deal done for ryan nugent hopkins and i think one of the main drivers behind it i mean if you could go into an off season and tell me you're delivering a better player than ryan nugent hopkins then i think yeah of course you have to have that discussion but Outside of like Gabriel Landeskog, who I'd be shocked doesn't if he doesn't remain in yeah. Colorado. Um, outside of that, I don't, there's not a player of it. There just isn't. There isn't a player available that can do what Ryan Nugent Hopkins can do for you, and that is play on the wing. I'm not going to sit here and say he's a lock on the first line wing, but he can play the wing for you in your top six. He can play center for you in your top six. I think he fits in extremely well in that power play with McDavid and Drysital. Uh, you know, he penalty kills for you. He's, he's I, 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 to me, I think there's some value in wanting to be here and continuing to grow. This dude has been the ultimate through darkness. He has survived everything. How many coaches has he had? Like seven yeah, at different seven times like that, over yeah. the last 11 years. So I think, I think there's some value in that. And I'm not saying reward it with an extra million and a half, but you know, if, if they walk away from Ryan Nugent Hopkins at six and a half and, and people think that's a good idea, I just, I just don't think a combination of Adam Lowry and somebody else are going to replace what Ryan Nugent Hopkins. The weird thing with Nuge is that we don't view him as a goal scorer. Like, I don't know if you think about him as a goal scorer, but 
he's basically scored at a pace of like 27 goals for the last three years. And he's on a 26 goal pace this year. And he's not even really a guy that you'd identify as a goal scorer. He's got a decent shot, but you know, I, I think people don't realize how effective and consistent he has been for this organization. So I think there's a deal to get done. And the reason I, the only reason I put that 6.25 million out there is because Rashad said that they were going to talk with the Oilers again. And apparently, you know, they have had that and it was between six and six and a half. So it just seemed like a meet in the middle number. And I think five years is a fair term. What do you get them in 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. And I, I, you know, might be a little bit of a fall off at the end of that, but I don't think it would be that significant. Uh, Before we move on, where do you think the leverage leans here? Like you, you've talked about Nugent Hopkins being, you know, these hard to replace, right. And he's got to know that his market's got his, agents got to know that that you're going to have a hard time finding a Nugent Hopkins if you have to replace Nugent Hopkins but there's also the side of it that we have to know and probably think he doesn't want to go anywhere like he, he'd like to stay it's in true. Edmonton he'd like to get the deal done so who has the leverage there I mean is it one of those things where it doesn't get to that point or somebody has to kind of bend and back off and go okay fine we'll give you the 6.75 or you know what screw it let's do the 6.2 and we'll get other people signed around me like who's got the leverage and that's a great question because both sides have a little bit of it. Like, like I just said, there's not another player available this year that can do all the things that Ryan Nugent Hopkins can do for you. Maybe their organization doesn't need all those things. Like maybe they think they'd be better off with a natural goal scoring winger on the left side. To be honest with you, there's not many of those guys available either. Yeah. Uh, and so, not that won't you know, cost you more money, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, yeah. So and it's such, the leverage is such a great question. I mean, the, the part where you said, hopefully it doesn't get there. I mean, hopefully it doesn't, because I honestly, I do think that these two parties do need and want each other. I honestly yeah. think they do. I mean, we know Ryan Nugent Hopkins does not want to leave. Is he going to go somewhere else for seven when he can get 6.25 or 6.5 here? Is that, you know, after being here for so long and actually possibly in my opinion, they've at least turned a corner from, you know, Man, they just can't make the playoffs too. I think they're a playoff team no matter the division they're in. Like, I I think they're, especially even with the goaltending they have right now, I still think they're a playoff team, which is like that next step to becoming a contender. And if you're Ryan Nugent Hopkins, I mean, you could just leave for money. There might be a couple of spots out there that'll have some money for you, but is it going to put you in a better chance to win a title here in the second half of your career? And it would have to be a situation on that front. So if I... The flat cap, I think, probably gives a little bit of leverage to the team yeah. over the player. But at the same time, uh, I don't think it's like they're in the driver's seat by any stretch of imagination. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be very interesting to watch. And and I heard somebody else say it this week. If he goes anywhere, he's probably going to a team that isn't as good. And he's probably going to a place where a lot more responsibility is going to be put on his shoulders. And if you're being paid that kind of money as a potential first, uh, at least a second line center, you have to produce. And that's the kind of pressure not that he can't handle it, but he's not really had to handle it before McDavid and Drysaddle. There was Hall and Everly, and he, just, he was never been the number one guy, and he wouldn't be in Edmonton if he stayed, right? So that's got to be a deal here too. Um, what about the Blackhawks story that I sent you today? We were talking a little bit, and it's been all over the news about how Chicago might be open to taking some bad contracts. So not that Nugent Hopkins' deal at six point five or seven would even be a bad contract, but they do have a couple, and James Neal specifically is who I'm thinking about. They'd love to be able to move him, but there's never been a situation really where that was a a realistic option. And this year he's not producing, he's not playing um, and he's making a lot of money for a guy who's not playing very often. Is there even a remote possibility that this thing is Chicago is a real deal and could Edmonton take advantage of it? I, I think the remote possibility of the thing with Chicago being real. I mean, if you're Chicago and you have an opportunity in a, in a time where everybody is desperate to free up cap space. It's like every, anybody who, who wants to go for it this year, it's pretty much up against it. There might be one or two rare exceptions out there. So if you're the Blackhawks right now, I think the big question comes down to, are you willing to take on deals that linger past just this year or next year at the most? That's probably the big question for Chicago. Cause I mean, first of all, Chicago's, you know, passing all of our expectations this year yeah. and they're doing it without key key guys up front so you have to think where they're sitting right now hey you know we're ready to move forward for the next couple of years and kind of get back in the mix not saying they aren't this year but in that division they're in there's some some top end talent that'll be tough yeah. to get through uh come the postseason but you, so i don't think i don't think you want to 
you put your organization in a bad spot moving forward just to just to pick up picks because you're capable of doing that this year. Uh, but if you know if your team sitting here that wants to, you know, we talked about it a lot with Edmonton and James Neal would be an example. But the whole money in and money out thing, if you can somehow bring in the Blackhawks to help with the money in and money out, an impossible three team deal even, uh, and you know, and have to flip them a pick, and the Oilers aren't in a great spot with picks this year, but down the road, you know, the James Neal thing, it would. <laughs> You know, it's it's not he's not getting a ton of opportunity. It's not like he's not producing in the top six, but he's basically sure. become a guy who makes that much money and is a fringe player in this lineup. Like when healthy with Archibald and Cassian, and, and the fact that they use Chase on the top unit power play, James Neal's probably gonna be a healthy scratch when this team is healthy. So I mean, when he was on the power play last year, scoring a bunch of goals for you early in the season, you still didn't love the contract, but at least you could justify it a little bit. And you can't really do that right now. So, you know, the big question comes down to what would the Oilers be willing to give up to part to get rid of him? And at the same time, are you doing it just to get rid of him? Or are you doing it to actually improve your team in another way via another trade? And, uh, you know, would you do it just to get rid of him, Or does it have to be part of something bigger? I think those are all the intriguing things, but you know, Chicago's in, in, in a beautiful spot here. Cause it's not just the Oilers. There's a lot of teams around oh, yeah. the national hockey league that would be looking at that and saying, okay, you know, they could probably pick up, two to three pretty decent picks, I think, prior to the deadline with that cap space that they've got. Yeah. Uh, and maybe Neil's the, the grand thinking. It's the big contract that Edmonton would like to move, but probably isn't the most realistic contract because it would really have to work for Chicago to even consider it. But if it wasn't Neil and there is a dollar in, dollar out deal for the Oilers that could be potentially out there, is there a person on this roster that you see is maybe making too much or not kind of producing at that level or could be sacrificed based on his contract to try to maybe make that dollar in dollar out deal kind of work. Uh, I think it would probably have to be a combination of guys really. I mean, if you're looking at a dollar in dollar out deal, like the, the conversation that's popped up lately is the whole Eric Stahl thing, which I mean, probably not going to happen, but the, when you looked at it dollar in dollar out, what was he at 3.25 million yeah. coming out of Buffalo? I mean, you have Cassian, but Buffalo's not going to want to take all the years remaining on Cassian's deal. So that's not going to work. And then you're basically looking at some sort of combination of Alex Chase on and somebody else, something along those lines would have to be the guys. And, you know, Chase on Chase on has, he, he frustrates me a little bit because of all the opportunity he gets, but he does do some good things on that power play. Like yeah, he, he, sure. he, he definitely, he definitely knows what he's doing out there, which I think is a, is a big part of it. And I haven't mind him five on five actually recently either. So, but I think he would have to be part of, you know, a deal with another million bucks or something moving out. Tourists would be a guy once he's cleared from COVID protocol, that, um, that would be a guy that, you know, if you could get rid of the year on his contract next year, I don't mind Turris, you know, is a bit player in the bottom six for the rest of this year, but I don't know if you want another year of Kyle Turris. So that would be a money in money out situation, possibly combined with a, a chase on type to get somebody that's you know, like a guaranteed middle of the road winger, you know, that second line, third line, the guy that's locked in there, as opposed to a bunch of these guys who come in, in, in and out of your lineup. You want a guy who's, who's locked in there every night. Yeah, I agree. Totally. And I like Chase on's game. He's somewhere between the first year he came to Edmonton and last year. Like he's yeah. in that middle road, right? Like he wasn't, as, he wasn't the 20 goal guy that we saw the first year, but he certainly isn't as uh, he's, he was a little less productive last year. People are like, yeah, this is what Chase on is. And then when we resign him, everyone's like, why are you doing that? But he's turned into a much better player. So I think he does have a spot on this roster for sure. I want to switch gears a little bit though, because last night's game, and we talked about this in the first half of our show with some of our other writers and hockey readers, but there was a lot of stuff that came out of last night's game. It wasn't exactly the prettiest game. It was a Daryl Sutter type Calgary Flames game, but there was a lot of eventful news coming out of this game for the Oilers. Uh, I want to first touch on the Jujar Kara uh, situation. One, I want to get your take on the hit. Two, I want to get your take on the fight and the code that goes with that fight. And then what do you think happens with Kara now? Have we heard anything? Is he, other than day-to-day, -day, do we know what the status is on him? Yeah, I didn't see any sort of update today, so we'll see how this plays out. I mean, this, this I, I don't want to say it could be devastating to Jujar Kara's career, but depending on the significance of this injury, I mean, he was playing, 
I would say the best and most consistent hockey he ever has for the Edmonton Oilers. Like he had in a bottom six that you're basically trying to rotate guys in and out of essentially with maybe the exception of him and, and Josh Archibald and, and chase on recently. Uh, you know, he, I didn't think he had this in him to be honest with you when they, when they put him on waivers, first of all, I didn't think anybody was going to claim him, And I wasn't too sure what type of role he had on this team moving forward. And he has, He's very, he's impressed me a lot, actually coming back. Yeah. This is, this is the, this is the exact Juju carry you want and need moving forward for the organization. Um, so devastating to see the injury, the hit itself. I mean, it's, every single aspect of this can basically be viewed from both sides, both, the, both sides of the discussion, like the hit itself. He, he didn't lift his body up into the check. He didn't really even lift his elbow into the head. It was an unfortunate situation of a bigger guy hitting a guy who was engaged and had his head down and, you know, got hit in the head. So I, th- I think a hit like that should be two minutes. Like I, I, but I also understand how the officials missed it because there was a body there, you know, kind of outside the boards. Like I understand uh, with that being said, if they would have called that penalty, I'm not sure the code would have need to be taken care of later in the game and probably could have solved a lot of issues. Um, also in that fight, I do think the linesman could have done a better job hopping in when Jujar Kara yeah. got knocked down on the ice and Richie was feeding him. The line, well, the one linesman looked like he wanted to get in and he probably should have got in. I don't know how linesmen operate in those situations. You see a guy get up off his feet quite a bit. Personally, you know, as soon as a guy goes down, even if they're still trying to fight back, I'd probably try to hop in and stop it. I, you know, and then so I mean, as far as the code goes, I, I think the National Hockey League, you know, that they want to eliminate as much fighting as they possibly can from the game, and I think they've done that. Like the the days of the heavyweight in the National Hockey League are gone, and they're not coming back. Like Ryan Reeves can walk around out here in the National Hockey League like a tough guy, and he is in this league, but Ryan Reeves would have been a nobody, you know, 20 years ago as far as toughness goes. Like it's just, it's it's completely evolved to the point where you don't have those guys anymore that do that. So when it's called upon, you know, you got your Darnell Nurses and your Jujar Karas, you know, guys who are tough dudes, but at the same time, first of all, you don't want them having to scrap. And, and, and you know, Jujar Kara hasn't done it that often. I'm not saying he's not capable of it, but it, I was in a weird spot last night because I'm not anti-fighting. Like, I, I think it'll always in some way, shape or form be a part of the game, even if it ends up 15 years from now, it's an automatic suspension. If you fight, there'll still be fights in hockey. I mean, there's just things that happen that get you fired up. But so Jujar Carey gets in that fight last night, gets popped. And I'm sitting there with my boy, six years old. And we always, you know, we'll be playing hockey in the basement. We'll drop the mitts and we'll mess around. And, but that's the first time he's watched a fight where he saw somebody get knocked, like saw his eyes roll back and go down on the ice. And I was, it was a little awkward for me because I looked at him and, and I wanted to see his reaction. And he was, he was, yeah, I could see he was thinking about like, well, this isn't good, but like usually fights aren't, you know, you don't see that in a fight. So yeah. I said to him, I said, yeah, buddy. I said, sometimes in a hockey fight, you know, you can get punched really hard and, and you can get hurt. And then all he said was, well, I like Jujar. I hope he's okay. And I, you know, I don't want to see him have to leave the game, but it was a weird one for me watching my boy who's just getting into hockey kind of deal with that for the first time. So I, I'm just so torn on this, man. Like I hate seeing that, uh, but I also think it's an easy spot to attack fighting in the game when yeah. a lot of the time two guys fight, maybe somebody breaks a hand on a helmet or whatever. And you know, that's going to happen too. But a lot of the time, you know, both guys go to the penalty box, come out and everybody's fine. So it's, I, it's, I, I'm so torn on it. I I did for the longest time. I didn't think I'd ever be this torn on it, but it's gone to the point where I, where I now am. I don't, I don't love it. I think it's a part of the game and I still kind of like, like to see it once in a while, but I feel bad about it now. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I I was kind of like you when I watched that last night, because one, I'm thinking, I'm I'm hoping he's okay. Uh, And two, I'm immediately thinking, man, I don't recall ever seeing a Jujar Kara fight that was so one-sided, not either winning or yeah. losing, but he, I mean, he lost, he clearly lost that fight and he's never really had to deal with really beating up another guy or getting beat up. And you hope wonder, and you said, you don't know if it's devastating for his career. We talked about the, with this guys with the guys earlier tonight. It's like, does this change his game coming back? Like when he's ready to go, does it change his, um, he was consistently good this season. So does it change the way he approaches the game? Does it change his willingness to get in there and scrap? Does it change his, 
you know, attitude towards that stuff. Cause you see it and he's not a heavyweight and there's not a lot of heavyweights left in the league, but you used to see this all the time when a heavyweight get in a big fight and then lose. Sometimes that's the last you ever saw the guy, right? Like that would be it for him. Cause that was what his job was. And when you couldn't do that job, you were out. And so I'm hoping that's not the case that he doesn't come back a different, less, um, you know, aggressive player, but, but he needs to, he needs to continue to play the way he has, right? Like the reason he's been so successful and I don't, I'm not too sure who's recording hits, but there's been some games where he's had like 10, 11, 12 hits. And I'm just, and you know, when you do, when you do that, I mean, this is the example of it. You know, you're going to catch somebody in a way that pisses their team off. And, you know, and even in today's national hockey league, you know, the, the, and it's the players, it's the players code. It's not our code. It's not the fans code. It's not a media code. It's it. They're the players. I mean, those are the guys on the ice. They know what they're getting into in those situations. So, you know, at some point, you know, the, the league, and like I said, they've done a pretty good job eliminating this type of thing. The league, you know, hopefully you would hope that officials can handle this in a little bit of a better situation. So it doesn't have to get there. If, if you, if you look at a lot of the code stuff that's popped up, it has been because of, poorly officiated situations that players feel they need to take care of themselves. So, you know, you know, refs and refs aren't going to get everything called, but if they can call it correctly, the majority of the time, and, and maybe, you know, maybe be extra cautious in those plays and say, you know what, let's give them two. Cause they would have been right on it in that situation. I do think it was yeah. a two minute penalty. Um, you know, and then that gets taken care of and Richie doesn't have to go over and say, Hey, you're fighting me. And it goes the other way too. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been guilty of it on the show when I've said, you know, you know, so-and-so, you know, he might have to pay for what he did to what, whoever tonight. And, you know, maybe that's not the way we should be talking anymore, but it's, it's still a part of the game that we watch and cover. So it is a story and that's why we're talking about it here tonight. For sure. One of the other things that happened in that game last night, which everybody's talking about is Tyson Berry. Uh, so he leaves. We're not really sure what happened or where the injury occurred. What's going on. Tries to come back in the third, isn't able to go. Um, from what I've heard last, and maybe you have more information than I do is he's day to day. Um, do we know kind of what happened? And if it's anything more than just a game or two, is it very going to, will fans very quickly realize how important he is to this team? Well, yeah, we don't know anything right now. I think Tippett kind of said it was kind of upper body, kind of lower body. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they're even saying UBI or LBI anymore because they can get away with just unfit to play if they want. So it, Tyson Berry has come in here and done everything you expected him to do. Well, he's even to me, he's even surpassed my offensive yeah, expectations. Like he's come in here and he's been he's been excellent. He's he's been a dream offensively for the Oilers. He's everything you could have asked for offensively for the Oilers. And I thought I thought the blue line this year kind of came down to a couple of things. And that was the play of Adam Larson and the play of Tyson Berry five on five. Like if you can get good five on five play from those two guys, you're probably going to be in a pretty good spot. And Larson's been terrific. I've loved Larson lately. Uh, and, and Tyson Berry's been pretty good five on five. I mean, I think there's some areas where he could definitely look after the puck a little bit better, especially in his own end. And he's a little bit of a risk taker, but you're going to get that from a guy who's, what is he like 0.8 points per game right now or 0.7 yeah. points per game. He's been, he's been excellent there, but they will miss him. And I took some heat on Twitter last night and from, from the pro Ethan bear crowd, because I just said, I, I didn't want to go either. there actually. With yeah. You. Yeah. I know. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm not afraid to talk about it. like Ethan Baird. I, I, I know the Corsi number said, you know, from a shot perspective, he did very well last night, but I didn't like his game last night. I thought he was fighting it quite a bit with the puck. Um, obviously we all know he made a poor decision on the fourth goal last night. Uh, and, and you, you know, last year he was put in a role to play a lot of minutes rather regularly. What was he like? Did he lead all rookies in ice time last yeah. year? Wasn't he? Yeah. He yeah. Did. So, yeah. but he hasn't been there this year, right? He hasn't, he hasn't had to go out and play 22, 22 minutes a night because they've had Tyson Barry and then bear was coming back and they're kind of trying to slowly work him back into the mix. So, uh, you know, this is a huge opportunity. If Barry's out, it's a huge opportunity for Bear. And I'm very interested to see if Bouchard gets some power play time on that top unit. Because Darnell Nurse, I mean, Nurse has kind of been that other guy with Barry. But if Barry's out, you know, Bouchard jumps ahead of everybody on the right side to be a power play guy. And I'd really like to see that. So uh, I, 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 I know some people say, ah, you know, they, and I saw it today on my show with some text messages. Ah, they won't miss Barry. 
that's a ridiculous thing to say. They're going to miss Tyson Berry. I know I feel more comfortable watching this team with Barry and Nurse together than with Nurse and Bear together right now. And this is not, I'm not anti Ethan Bear. The Ethan Bear is in his second year. Like it's okay to have a bad game. And it's okay to say that I didn't like what I saw last night as opposed to the numbers. And if, if you want to look and build your case off, you know, the analytics last night, that's okay too. Um, but it's like, nobody's saying, well, I guess some people might be throwing him into trade proposals, which is also ridiculous, but like, I'm not sitting here saying that. I'm just, you know, he could, he could very well play with Darnell nurse tomorrow night and have a really good game. And then I'll say, Hey man, he had a really good game tonight. Like it's, yeah. it's, I, I just don't think you need to be overly protective or overly critical of anybody when the team's playing as well as they, they have been so far here, especially over the last month and a half. Well, Ethan Baird, no pun intended, has been super polarizing this season. Um, and I wrote an article recently talking about why I think if you're talking about trading him, you're just wrong. But I'm with you. I didn't think that was a great game for him last night. I thought that pinch in the neutral zone was a bad, bad play. And he's bound to make mistakes. He had a rough start at the beginning of the season. We get it. He had some injury issues. He's only however many games into his career. So he's bound not to be good. And then Tyson Berry, you're talking about a guy who's been great offensively. Uh, but he's a home run swinger, right? And so when you yeah. talk about baseball, you wear an Expos hat. If you're a home run hitter, you're going to strike out every once in a while. So you're going to take shots that don't work. You're going to have some lapses on defense. And it is just what it is. Um, but I'm curious, and you brought it up a little bit. Where do you think the Oilers lean? Are they heavily in on Bouchard? Because they've been pretty hesitant to put him in on a regular basis. When he first came in, he seemed to be playing pretty well. He didn't have to ask the guy to shoot twice. He's very much like a Tyson Berry type of player. Uh, but they've been a little hesitant to use him lately because I think maybe Tippett sees something there that he's not quite in love with, um, but they know he's going to be a long-term asset. Or do you, they give that responsibility to Ethan Bear, knowing that this season hasn't always been as great as last season? Yeah, I would, I would think that it's pretty protected minutes for Bouchard against a pretty aggressive Calgary team. When, and, and it should be. He, when he hasn't played for as long as he has to get thrown in there against Calgary, assuming that's what happens – then I'm pretty sure Tippett will try to find some soft spots for him in that lineup. And, and then Ethan Bear will be, you know, put back yep, to some significant minutes. And, and, and with that being said, I mean, I do think you could see a situation where Bouchard plays like eight, nine, 10 minutes, even strength gets three minutes of power play time is 13, 14 minute guy in his first game back. It would, it would mean a heavy workload for Larson and bear on the right side, but you know, that could be something that, that you need to just look at for the next little while. It's, it's a weird year because in a perfect situation, you'd love to have Bouchard, you know, in the, in the American league playing 24, 25, 26 minutes a night on a pretty darn good team right now, and then have the ability to fly him up for a week and get him yeah. into some games and then send him back down. So as far as his development goes, they're just in a tough spot. It's not their problem right now. Um, I mean, just quickly back to bear. Like we still, we still don't know what Ethan bear is, right? Like yeah. Ethan bear, might not ever be as good as he was last year. And Ethan bear is probably better than he has been so far this year. Like it's probably somewhere in between. I, so, you know, anybody who thinks that they've come to the conclusion, a conclusion on Ethan bear right now, it's, it's, that's, that just can't be right. It just can't be right. You cannot possibly have a read on who a defenseman is this early into his national hockey league career, especially considering he was such a surprise to everybody yeah. last year. Like maybe he just had a phenomenal season. Maybe this is who he is right now. We don't know. Like we don't know. And we won't know for probably another 18 to 24 months, exactly who Ethan bear is and what he means to this blue line. So, and then there's opportunity there for Bouchard coming. He's just going to have to be patient. I think this year, which I know frustrates a lot of people. Um, frustrates me a little bit as well. I do like watching him play, man. He's so smart. He's so smart. Yeah. He's just, you can tell why he absolutely owned the Ontario hockey league. And you can tell why he put up good numbers in the American hockey league. Cause if you're thinking the game better than 85% of the guys on the ice, it's going to be a pretty big advantage to you every single game. Well, I think you nailed it on the head when you said that uh, the people who are wanting to see him in an ideal year play in the AHL. If he were playing in the AHL on a regular basis, nobody would be saying, hey, get Evan Bouchard in. Everybody would be complimenting the others for slow playing, yeah. somebody who could be a huge part of their future. But because they can't do that, and he's just sitting there not doing anything, everybody wants to see him play. So it is a tough spot, and I don't envy any of the teams that have to go through that and make decisions on, on young rookies and stuff like that. Uh, i got one more for you before I let you go here. Um, we've talked a lot in our show this week about 
you know, maybe what the Oilers see themselves doing here before April 12th, if there's a potential for a trade, we know Holland has said dollar in dollar out. We talked about that a little bit, you and I, but is there something that if you're Ken Holland, if you could put his hat on for a minute and make a deal, make some kind of, you're going after something, you're trying to find someone, what are you doing if you're him and how do you try to improve this team as handcuffed as you may be? Yeah, it's, it's a tough situation. Like, Considering how passionate everybody is in this market, he's probably in a lose-lose situation. You don't do anything. People are going to criticize you. You you go out and you pull the trigger on something that you think might work and it doesn't. People are going to criticize you as well. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of areas that you would look to address. I do think, like, the goaltending, as much as people want something different there, I would be, like, stunned if he actually managed to change the goaltending this year. So that is what it is. I. Uh, I'll be interested to see what happens with the top six here. I mean, it was fun for McDavid and dry to go out and embarrass the Ottawa senators. But I mean, do you keep that rolling or do you kind of go back to, it's not like the original top six wasn't working. I mean, they got on a pretty good tear once they moved, kind of moved Jesse Pugliarvi up with uh, McDavid and Nugent Hopkins. That's kind of when things got going in February, right? And they had yeah. the Cahoon and dry So, you know, I, I think they'd be okay there. I think you, if you could find somebody depending on what, the status of Juju Carey is here. If you could find somebody that could play third line center and and maybe if you need him, slide up, up onto the wing on the left side in your top six, I think that would be great. But I the the biggest issue for me, the biggest need for me, and I I like William Legison. I do. I think he's when they didn't put him on waivers, they're like, oh, you know, so we don't want to lose him. I was like, everybody's got a William Legison. Don't worry, they're not. Nobody's going to claim him, but. You know, they kept him, and I think it's paid off. Like, he's relatively steady, and there's nothing mm-hmm. special about him, but he's steady. But for this team right now in a playoff where you're going to have to go through one of or possibly both Winnipeg and Toronto to come out of the division, I would like to see an upgrade on that left side blue line behind Darnell Nurse. I think if you can lock in Nurse and Barry and Adam Larson – and another veteran defenseman on that left side. And then you rotate your Bears and your Bouchards and your Russells and whoever else you want in that bot Jones and Legacy, whoever you want in that bottom pair. Uh, if you can solidify that top four with a, a veteran presence on the left side, I think that would go a long way to making this team a much more difficult team to beat. If you can get a guy with playoff experience, that would be great uh, in that in that second line or second D pair spot on the left side. So that would probably be my priority. That is likely easier to do. I think than top six left winger. Uh, it's just a matter of what the price will be. And if, if tip or if uh, Holland wants to, to go that route, but I think for me, that would be the biggest need. And it's funny that we say that too, because of the fact that there were so many years we were looking for a righty. I know. Now, so, now we've got so crazy. Isn't it? Now we've got so many of them, right? <laughs> Well, it doesn't make uh, it, well, I mean, you get Barry, but Larson bouncing back has been so big for yeah, this team. Yeah, it's been huge. Larson, it's been huge. And then, you know, you, you get Bear, who like came out of nowhere last year, and then Bouchard, who you drafted because you had nobody on the right side. And now all of a sudden, they're all here and they're all playing relatively well or okay, I guess you could say. Um, it's, yeah, it's, buddy, I've been doing my show for 11 years and literally every deadline or free agency for 11 years, it's been right shot D-man, right shot D-man, right shot D-man. And now you got one that you can't even get in the lineup. Yeah. Do you think Larson's played his way into another contract? I'd, I'd give him two more years. I yeah. would dev- I'd give him, t- I think that would be, I don't know what the number would be, um, but I'd give him two more years. I think, I think two more years of Adam Larson, is probably a good thing for this team moving forward, which I don't think I would have said, or many people would have said last year, but I think two more years of Adam Larson, does he not, to me, it looks like he's kind of slimmed down a little bit. Like he's getting around a little bit better. He, he looks to me like he's, and I can't speak to what was going on in his head and he had some really tough tough stuff to go through, but he just looks focused. He looks like he's in the games. He looks mentally prepared to take on whatever, to play as many minutes as you need to. He just looks more like he's, totally in it all the time. And I, in our mid season awards that haven't come out yet on the hockey Raiders.com, but will I had him as my top defenseman on the Oilers. Now I know everybody's going to probably pick Darnell nurse, which is one of the reasons I picked Larson, but I would absolutely debate people all day long about how good he's been. So 
Well, on, I think it was on two guys and a goalie, uh, well, probably well, right before the beginning of the season. I said, Adam Larson's the most important defenseman on this team. Keep it or clip it. And the boys all clipped it. They said they didn't agree. But the reason I asked that question, because you know Darnell Nurse is going to have to play 25 minutes. And you know what you're going to get from Darnell Nurse on the left side. To me, if Adam Larson doesn't play well, you got nothing. Like you got nothing in that second that second pair if Adam Larson isn't playing well. So the fact that he's kind of been able to stabilize that second pair, whether it be with Russell or Slater Cuckoo before that or William Legison right now, uh, I think it's one of the under-talked-about stories for the Oilers this year. For sure. Well, let's leave it at that. I won't keep you any longer than that. I appreciate you coming on again. Do you got any more recordings you got to do tonight, or was this it? Uh, no, not tonight. It's Tuesday during the football season. I have a fantasy football extravaganza to do. And you know what? I'm so pathetic that I've actually been thinking about doing one of those a month anyway, just to talk about fantasy football in the off season. So I don't know. We'll see what happens, but uh, no, this was fun, man. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on again. And, uh, yeah, maybe we'll bug you sometime down the line to do this again. If you're not too busy. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Dustin.